Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest with us today. It is Britton Kolber, and he is a psychotherapist and an author of a very special book that he's going to be telling us about today. So I'm very excited to have him on the show. But before I begin, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to DMA World. They are a marketing consultant agency, and they believe in helping the little person. They hate when people get scammed by these big marketing companies, and they don't want you to throw away your money. So come and visit dmaworld.com where they help the little businesses grow to become big, 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 blah, 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 big businesses <laughs> and they don't have to spend a fortune. So, you know, let's focus on dmaworld.com and they will help you grow into the business that you want to become and reach the goals that you've always dreamed of reaching. So let's throw it on to our special guest today. And Britton, tell us a little about yourself and tell us what you do, because I'm very excited to have you on the show. This is great. Go ahead. I'm happy to tell you more. I, I just want to comment on the sponsor. And I'm so glad that there are people that are sponsoring um, little people, you know, like the special vehicle accommodations, you know, not clothes don't always fit everyone. You know, I worked with a little person when I was uh, in, uh, in undergraduate and I know this is not exactly what you're talking about. I'm just taking us in a sideways direction. But that's I think awesome. that's true. I mean, you know, there's there is a lot of stuff that's for people that are little in stature and also the small businesses. You know, that's a really cool thing. Um, so about me is I am a psychotherapist. And <laughs> um, I think it's important to uh, be kind to people and also find ways to laugh you know, find ways for us to get to a sense of safety. Uh, right. Because like being able to laugh about things is such an amazing way to feel like you're not alone. Exactly. And so this is the stuff I've learned over many years. Um, but also just as a psychotherapist, uh, I've been in practice for about uh, 11 years now. And um, I've seen lots of really difficult stories. I've seen lots of hard times people have been through. And it is such an amazing thing when I can help someone get to the point where they start to like, oh, oh yeah, that's me again. I'm catastrophizing. I'm making a much bigger thing than it is. Right. So those kinds of things are like amazing, you know, to be a part of, to help facilitate. Um, and that's one of the things that has guided this book uh, is, uh, so I wrote a book called uh, Not Fishy Enough. And Not Fishy Enough is a ridiculous parable about finding worth through self-acceptance. And um, it's a hard road. And yeah. if we can make it just a little bit easier, um, that would be great. And that's the mission of this. Now, do you feel, you know, I feel learning how to accept ourselves is so important yeah. because I feel like many people do not accept who they are or in their heart on themselves. And, you know, they, you know, they really, you know, people have to really focus on the positive things about themselves and the strengths. And when they come across the negative things or they come across the things they don't like, I would think it's really good to stop for a second. Let's focus yeah. on those, those really, those beautiful strengths about ourselves yeah. and give ourselves a pat on the back. And if we don't like something, maybe it's time to set some goals, not hard goals, but maybe, you know, some short-term goals and some long-term goals yeah. and try to like maybe accomplish a little bit each day to get, get yourself to that point where you can build that thick skin and mm -hmm. build that self-esteem and be able to really learn to accept who you are and then get to the stages where you actually love who you are. How do you feel about that? I think it's great. I mean, I think it's wonderful when people can do it because of what I've had the privilege of being able to be a part of. I also know that there are good reasons why people don't. And mm -hmm. that's hard, been hard for me to wrestle with. So let's say someone... Um, has a problem with uh, breaking promises to a partner mm -hmm. or they have a problem with um, alcohol and they want to stop. They don't know how. And then you say, oh, it's, you know, well, self-acceptance do this. Well, wait, so I'm supposed to accept the fact that I keep cheating on my partner and that makes me fine. Or I'm supposed yeah. to accept that I have a bottle of tequila a day. I'm, I, how, is, how does self-acceptance work? And it's like, ah, okay, I see how you got there because you don't want to keep doing that. Right. And so what I try to tell people to do is 
um, how do I put this? It's important to have a growth mindset. I mean, there, there are books written about this. There are others that go into more detail on this. But if you have believed that it's possible to change, then this self-kindness stuff makes sense or the self-acceptance stuff makes sense. Right. And if you like, it means you can like part of who you are and you can like even all of who you are and not be okay with what you keep doing. Right. You know, like I can like me in a holistic sense, mm -hmm. but I can also change and start drinking less or join a program or figure out why I keep trying to get love at all costs, even if it means cheating on my partner. Does that right. make sense? No, it definitely makes sense. Now let's get down to it. Do you yeah. think that people really give a damn about being valued or listened to, or do you think it's just that they're too self-absorbed to care? Because a lot of people keep doing and repeating the same behavior over and over and over again. Do they, you know, are people, you know, we live in a society where people, yeah. you know, are sometimes, you know, they, they don't look at what, how they're affecting other people. Mm -hmm. They get so self-absorbed in mm -hmm. what they mm -hmm. are, doing, mm -hmm. what they want and what their goals are that they kind of, yeah. you know, they, they forget about the people around them. And so how, how do you think people do, do you think people really give a damn when they're so mm -hmm. self-absorbed into themselves? And cause you know, if you're so, so self-absorbed into yourself, mm -hmm. you know, are yeah. you really care about accepting yourself and changing? Sure. That's a great question. Um, so I think it's, it could be affected by the confirmation bias. Like if you're looking for people to be self-absorbed, that's what you're going to find. You know, yeah. like, like we, if you have, if you get a new red umbrella, everyone suddenly has red umbrellas, you know, let's be the trendsetter, you know, you get yeah. a green car, everyone's got a green car. So that's confirmation bias. So that could be affecting it, but also there are a lot of people that are self-absorbed, you know, I mean, hundred yeah. percent with you there and self-absorbed is kind of similar to self-acceptance. Some people are like, well, I don't want to be self-absorbed. I don't want to be one of those people. So why should I accept myself? Like it's, it's better for me to be like excessively humble or not even humble, just like completely self-deprecating. So I don't end up being self-absorbed. You know, that, yeah. that pattern happens a lot. And the best combination that I run across comes from a woman named Roshi Joan Halifax. And she's kind of like Dalai Lama adjacent. I don't know what their relationship is, but I saw a video and they were hanging out. Um, and it's a two-parter. So that means um, sh her thing is strong back, soft front. So strong back is kind of like, well, you've got a spine and it's flexible. And if you bend over too much, you kind of lose who you are. You lose your, your stature, your poise. And the metaphor is about, um, so integrity as well as uh, valuing yourself, having values, living according to those values. Okay, that's part one. Um, the second part is being, is having a soft front. So a soft front is, your skin is well thick enough to kind of be able to hold your spine in, but open enough, soft enough to realize, oh, I was acting in my integrity and I thought this was great, but it impacted you. I'm sorry yeah. about that. You know, I'm I'm open to it. I'm not going to go into a shame spiral and like question like all of my life's decisions. Right. But I but going by that strong back, soft front, you are kind of like, okay, I'm open, I'm me. But I'm open to you. Like that joke was supposed to be funny. You didn't laugh at all. Right. How's that like for you? Does that, does that answer the, the self-absorbed question? Yes. No, it definitely does. It, you know, uh, I think people have to really realize that, you know, you know, we're going to, you know, sometimes we, everybody has a different personality and, you know, we, we tend to think that everybody thinks, you know, sometimes we forget everybody's their own individual and that everybody reacts mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. And that we really need to focus on what makes, um, you know, other people tick and what makes people sometimes off offensive, you know, yeah. and, you know, we have to really get out of ourselves, get mm -hmm. out of, you know, and, and, and not think so much about what we like, what we want, but actually, you know, think about other people around us and knowing and understanding. And I always say sometimes it's good to take a step back out of our own bodies and yeah. put yourself in a person's space for a minute. Mm -hmm. Right. When we put ourselves into that person and we try to think like them, mm -hmm. then we can understand why they're reacting the, right. the way they are. And sure. then we can respect that and maybe mm -hmm. 
we approach the way we're verbalizing ourselves mm -hmm. or the actions we're taking. Right. That way we can actually have a better relationship with other people. I think with self-acceptance, it, it makes us a better person because it yeah. gives us qualities of understanding others. And then the understanding others, I think we mm -hmm. start to learn how to understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it works both ways, you know, because mm -hmm. you're, you know, I think you, you really have to, you know, really care about, you know, other people in order to care, you know, get, you know. Mm -hmm. first, I think it's important to care about ourselves, you know, and mm -hmm. then that self-love, you mm -hmm. know, kind of shines through, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, definitely. Now you're so into self-acceptance. You really, mm -hmm. you know, you feel, um, you know, a passion for this topic sure. and I Oh, by the way, you're talking and all the work that you've put in, you know, throughout the mm -hmm. years, you know, have you ever, you know, ha has something ever happened in your life that mm -hmm. has made you so passionate about self-acceptance? Mm -hmm. I want to hear, like, spill the beans. Like, I want to hear all the, <laughs> the bean <laughs> spilling. Um, okay. So uh, I grew up, so I'm, I'm half Austrian. My dad was from Austria and my mom was from Texas. And if you know much about that those are very, very different cultures. So I kind of grew up in the middle of those and trying to be uh, like part of the group was almost impossible. Uh, like around first grade, I spoke, I actually had spent a year in Austria that I came back in first grade and I had an accent. And that was just not an especially friendly place to like, well, you know, you're you're not us. Yeah. You know, and so like, sure, passing is white, etc. But also, you know, being white, European American, but like emphasis on the European, there is a like, I, it was kind of like, oh, you're one of us, but you know, started talking and you're kind of not. Also, yeah. I had failed preschool three times. Now, that's hard to do. Um, and in fact, no one has ever, I, I haven't run into anyone else that has said like, oh, that happened to me too. Um, but what that means it was there was always a sort of questioning of like, what what is it about me and so part of that self-acceptance happened early where i started realizing actually my mom modeled this first to be honest with you yeah. thinking about it there was a story where they were asking me a question and i remember it this was kind of like a, are you going to go on to the next grade and yeah. said does a boat have wheels and i was like yes and you're like oh god <laughs> Because they were thinking, and you know, obviously very simplistic terms, trucks have wheels, cars have wheels, boats don't. But I was always thinking a couple of steps ahead. Yeah. Because, you know, and I was like, ah, this is a trick question. But I didn't even have the words for that. I knew like, oh, they were trying to like get me because I had already been interested in amphibious boats and boats had wheels on them and pulleys and stuff like that. Yeah. So self-acceptance happened super at a formative age, but I'm not saying it was always easy, but like the seed was planted. Like I'm like this. And yeah. that's what my story is a lot about is like, I'm like this. What if that's okay? Right. You know, you know and a lots of, I spent lots of other time sort of blending in with, uh, you know, or trying to kind of give up a little bit of who I was just to fit and mm -hmm. I never found it satisfying. I just felt right. like I was losing something. You know, there was yeah. some kind of safety in it. Yeah. I didn't feel right. I agree totally with you. You know, I, I, I found myself many times in that situation when I was learning how to accept who I am and, and then work on better in myself. You know, I, I find that many people, we have a lot of opinionated people in this world and, you know, life could be a roller coaster ride. It could be very harsh too. You know, these, you know, there are people always sharing of, you know, what they think you should do, what they think you should be, how they think you should act, what the way, right way is to, you know, but that's their perception that's not because everybody's their own individual mm -hmm. so you know do you have any tips for our listeners on on how to develop that thick skin you know like we it's like you said it's not self-satisfying -satisf when you mm -hmm. actually are doing things to be you know accepted by others you know mm -hmm. we're satisfied when we are our own person and we like the person we are mm -hmm. so when you have all those people around you and everyone's throwing out opinions you know of uh, of what they think you should be and act mm -hmm. and so forth, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you deal with people like that? How do you get that thick skin? How do you, mm -hmm. how do you 
comfortable in your own shoes? You know, do you have tips for the listeners on how they could actually, you know, be a leader and not yeah. a follower, not worry about the people around them or what they're saying? Well, I'm going to go kind of in my characteristic way, kind of sideways on this, because okay. I think thick skin is kind of useful, but I think mm -hmm. it's honestly useful only to a point. Okay. Because thick skin, as I'm seeing it, is a kind of a barrier between mm -hmm. you and me. And I think that's important, but it also kind of closes the door. If yeah. I have my skin is too thick, I don't really care what you think. Right. When it's nice to, but that means I could also be unintentionally, uh, mm -hmm stomp on your feelings when actually you're quite sensitive about something um but being th thick skinned is great because then well you're not rattled when someone says Ugh, you, know, you got those shoes you're like whatever you know i like them. <laughs> i don't care you know so it's a balance i mean my motto of my life has always been about balance so my tip would be around balance again like the thing with the strong back soft front you know it's like i have some integrity my skin is thick, but not so thick that I can't be open to like, I accidentally hurt your feelings and I didn't mean it. Right. Exactly. So, and also I think another key of this is to be, uh, and this is from straight out of Brene Brown's Gifts of Imperfection. And I think she had a great tip to say where the thing to focus on is being not perfectionistic but rather something else. So perfectionism is other focused. It's like, well, what will they think? I have to get it right so that they'll be okay. So that I'll be safe. So I will be kicked, I'll be kicked out of the tribe. You know, I'm wearing the right Pantone colors for this season. I'm not wearing white after the wrong yeah. day. There's all this constraint. And so if it's self-focused, if it's growth focused, then it's, well, am I better than I was last week? Cool. You know, if I'm weigh 350 pounds and I'm down to 335, I can feel good, even though I might be pretty overweight by other people's standards. But so right. it's me, it's self-focused, but not yeah. self-absorbed, you know, right. not, not at the expense of other people, exactly. not kind of pushing people away. And how, yeah. how do you feel about humor? Humor, you know, a lot of times, you know, they always say sometimes putting humor yeah. into it, you know, mm -hmm. not taking so seriously what others think, and even no. you know what you know how you feel as a person, you know, mm -hmm. not being so hard on yourself, you know, mm -hmm. maybe bringing humor into it. They say sometimes the science of it behind it, it, it it's mm -hmm. it's okay to like not look at life so seriously and yeah. to kind of chuckle off sometimes the the mm -hmm. hard th stuff and to sure. not be so hard on yourself and sure. nice to look at life you know in, in a yeah. fun way you know yeah. and not so much in a serious way how do you feel yeah. about that oh i feel really passionately about that because i have both taken myself way too seriously and mm -hmm. also accidentally really hurt some people with my with what i thought was funny at the time i had to go back and figure out how to repair that so i think it's it goes pretty deeply like i've been i've done um improvisational comedy um i did it in high school i did it with uh, a group called comedy sports that had a branch in austin um i've written some sketch comedy there's something about finding um you know not, not having like a, a whole lot of safety net you know yeah. you say something and then yeah you know it's out there and one of the best ways to get there is something that is true you know, it's not particularly clever, but it's true. You know, if you say things that are true, it kind of hurts a little bit when it's funny. Right. And it's important to balance that with a little bit of kindness. You yeah. Know, like power is important. You know, right. There's like the humor is safe when you're making fun of your friends that you've known for 10 to 15 years, you know, about right. that thing they do that's irritating or like they keep doing yeah um that's in a safe context you know it's a kind of a parallel power you know of like where's the punch going right mm -hmm. but um if you crack a joke about um immigrants even if it's true it's kind of gross you know it's not really great 
But if you sort of like well punched up in terms of like a power structure or like, you know, and, and the the people that have the most acceptance in the society, well, that's kind of also OK. And right. what, what that whole thing is about, not about like politicism and, and stuff like that, it's more about safety. Right. Because if you're using the power of who you are just accidentally by being in the world and you make fun of someone that has less, it stings a bit. It's like being like in kindergarten and the sixth grader makes fun of you. It's like, oh, I, I now I feel awful. Yeah. You know? So again, it's, it's something about true that's super important. It's something about safety. Like yeah. the, the, the coolest researcher about safety is Stephen Porges, at least in my opinion, um, is about, you know, lots of things about how trauma impacts people and they don't feel safe in their, in their body. They, you know, they, everything's kind of like a little amped, amped up for some people. And he has a, a section in a training I went to about how humor can help sort of settle you know right. if it's done safely you can actually build some resilience You're not yeah. taking everything seriously you know like i'm taking a massive risk when i have my pronouns rather than he him i say yeah. that guy the one with the nose because it's mm -hmm. like that you, you you're not doing the thing you're yeah. not you're you're you must be transphobic if you're not following the structure like no i care deeply i know that pronouns matter i know that setting up a system that's normal where everyone says what they are means that the person who's trying to figure it out you know or however they're doing it they're not singled out so right. it's a routine we do um but i also want to add some levity to it because gosh it's the whole therm thing gets really serious sometimes yeah you know yeah. and so i want to take it seriously but i also want to be like i'm 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 just some guy and i have right. my family knows you know is not small <laughs> you know I, I found myself doing that many times too and it yeah. it, it it kind of takes the the you know it it it, it kind of helps you really realize who you are and yes i i am this person and yeah i accept it and you know and you know what you know like you said we're not perfect you know yeah. and uh you know and sometimes we just have to make a joke about it because it's like you know we we know we have flaws and some things are changeable and some things are not going to change you know because it's a part of us who we are as a person totally. you know have you ever had like anything in your life that you know that you maybe you're in a situation where you just you know you were friends and like you said talking and mm -hmm. you just started to laugh your ass off because it, you yeah. know it was something about whatever you're talking about and yeah. if it, it, it was about you or yeah. you know mm -hmm. and you laughed your ass off because you know it was true and you know mm -hmm. and you don't have any problems with it but it yeah. made you feel better because you got to that point where yeah I accept myself mm -hmm. I I know like you said with your nose and you joked oh, yeah. around <laughs> yeah yeah well like part of how I used to cope with things is like I would get nervous, I would analyze. Yeah. And like after a while, you'd be like, dude, Britt, stop analyzing everything so much. Just, just, it's fine. And, you know, and people would otherwise, like, otherwise, you know, and, and others in the group would be like, yeah, it's like, oh, like that stings a little bit, but I, I'll kind of feel seen. Yeah. Like I feel, I feel like this thing that I'm touchy about, mm -hmm. you know, like, because it's like my defense mechanism. Yeah, it's actually kind of OK. Like that's a transformation. Yes, you know, it that's is. a massive transformation. Um, like one of the most uh, affirming things about this whole uh, view of humor that I have is um, I got to uh, meet and sort of connect with uh, one of my comedy heroes, uh, John Cleese of My Python. And the conversation we had a particular conversation about psychology so he's 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 passionate about it. he actually co-wrote a book with a psychiatrist uh in addition to his you know prodigious humor with monty python and the fish called wanda and lots of other things yeah um and so we talked about this and he's like there's something about well kindness yes you don't want to just be mean to people but also there's something about when we can like have a deep laugh 
that is yeah. transformational. Right. It can be. Like, it's yes. not, I used to think it was just two things. It was either something like stand up comics can use comedy to like often shield themselves from the actual change they want or the actual thing that's the problem. And they'll just kind of like laugh it off. You know, like that's the defense mechanism version of comedy. Right. And some people use it as like, okay, that was hard. And now I can laugh about it, you know, like, right. or that, that the laughing about it helps me get through it. Right. But I never, until I talked with John Cleese, it never occurred to me that it would just like, that comedy or the laughter could be the thing that just like actually does the change. You're like, right. I am transformed because I laugh my ass off. Yeah. And I think that's I, really cool. I think he's right. No, I, I think I agree with you because I think, you know, you know, when you overanalyze things and like you mentioned, you know, I feel like people get more, they overthink it. They make the problem bigger. Yeah. And they get more stressed and more and more anxiety comes about. And that's when all the other negative emotions follow through. Mm -hmm. And then the person is not accepting who they are. They are actually building a hole and they could easily yeah. fall into it. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. when, you know, ha you know, humor could be such a, a powerful tool. And I think also, you know, do you feel like it could be a cure all, you know, it kind of like help you with mm. anxiety? help you with frustration help you with depression you know can do you think it could save us from those clutches of uh, uh, mm. negative you know conditions like like dis depression and anxiety kind of yeah. falling on if we handle it in a different way I'm I'm like, hesitant. Give us a little I want to hear uh, it. yeah okay well I'm, I'm hesitant to have you know like I say it sort of cures everything yeah but I think it's a super important ingredient um, right I mean if we go back to um go back to some of the things in history uh native american tradition um some of the uh spiritual practices in in, in other places there's a no i don't have that i don't have it in front of me um but the coyote priest for example uh yeah. in native american is a trickster and part of the trickster is the trickster tradition is to shake things up right you know to get out of the rigidity of like yeah. whatever you were doing right not like the evil version but just shake things up a little bit yeah and that often involves laughing right so, uh in yoruba or like the the region of yoruba which i think comprises a couple of african countries um there's a character called papa legba or elegwa and he's a trickster that is sort of the, you have to go through him if you want to contact the, the ancestors or contact the spirits or contact anything spiritual. But he's messes with people. Like he, you know, there's stories, you know, in that tradition where like he paints the left side or the one side black and he paints one side white and he walks you know, between two villages. And one group says, I saw this white spirit. The other says, I saw this black spirit. And they get into a fight. He's like, yeah. Um, and so like even that character of like, let's make this funny uh, yeah. is in is in my book, is in Not Fish Enough. Like he's the character, there's an octopus okay. that is kind of the gatekeeper of like taking himself too seriously and yeah. actually being okay with himself you know he's part of the journey part of the transformation so right. i think it's a vital ingredient but you also need care you need support from people yeah. uh you have to have you know practice like what's going on with my body can i do that if you have trauma yoga can be helpful so yeah. you can like have your body on red alert and learn how to get through it anyway there's a lot of tools out there but yeah. i really hope we laugh at it ourselves just a little bit right I mean, you know like because being laughed at can be traumatic yes you know, we don't mm -hmm. want that no um but saying nobody can laugh well i don't think that works either no you know I've, I've talked to a lot of clients who had a previous therapist psychotherapist for example mm -hmm. and they complained their therapist had no sense of humor like they wouldn't <laughs> laugh and they found right. it really frustrating yeah you know how do you feel about like you know i i sometimes feel like sometimes laughter and humor could actually bring 
a group of people together. It could be like yeah. the glue that actually kind of bonds everybody and actually oh, yeah. brings sense of closeness and you could be different personalities but that mm -hmm. that that sense of humor that you all have and you mm -hmm. share you know, right. you're able to like let go and not analyze things and and just mm -hmm. like be yeah. comfortable in your own set of shoes and joke around yeah. about things that yeah. may not be you know quote unquote you know mm -hmm. perfect you know mm -hmm. I don't believe in yeah. the word perfect but you sure. know what I mean yeah. And, uh, you know, but it could be the sense of glue that bonds everybody together and maybe yeah. brings those relationships to a stronger level yeah. where you actually can yeah. have communication with each other. And also you could strengthen your inner strength of acceptance as yeah. well. How do you feel yeah. about that? Oh, I feel strongly about that. I mean, I'm not saying, again, I'm hesitant to say it cures everything, but I believe it's a super important ingredient. I mean, yeah. for example, like you and I were talking like briefly before we started, uh, yeah. I was asking about uh culture and your last name and then you talked about being greek and i was yeah. wondering if i could ask you when my big fat greek wedding came out <laughs> wasn't that was that delightful to kind of have self-acceptance and laughing honored for sure and and the the gentleman that played the father that was my father to a t to a part you know even <laughs> man, my no. father Yes, always had like <laughs> one solution, always cleaning, always cleaning. He was like the germ freak. He wanted to make everything had to be clean. Don't pick up anything dirty. Don't touch anything dirty, you know. And, you know, I remember I was a little kid and I was like, you know, I saw this balloon on the side of the of the road. It was still blown up and I went to touch it. He almost had a heart attack, you know, because he's like, you know, you don't know who put your hands on that, you know. And, and if, if he had Windex with him, he probably would have Windexed my hands back then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic yeah so yeah it sounds like we're really talking about you know a, a very similar experience of just there's something really healing about liking who you are loving who you are and even if there are things you don't like about yourself um you can if you have a growth mindset you can maybe start to change it because a lot of people believe i can't accept myself um because Yes, yeah. that's and, true. And, you know, or they were taught not to. Um, yes. And there's something I would love to just gently challenge about that, you know. Is that is that still useful, even though you were taught that? You know, I, I find that like with some of my clients, I, I, you know, one of the main things I think was brought up to me was that when someone tells you something so many times when you're growing up, you tend yeah. to believe it. And right. I think sometimes these people, you know, they've been told negative things about themselves, you know, because 70% mm -hmm. of the people in our society come from dysfunctional families. Wow. So if you come from 70% of the people come from dysfunctional families and someone is, is gearing negative energy into your ears, you know, on a consistent basis and you live in a negative environment, yeah. you tend to either carry those behaviors or you <laughs> tend to really absorb that negativity and you start to believe what they tell you because they're your parents they know what they're talking about sure. and then you go into the world and you're believing that you are this character this personality that mm -hmm. you, you know you could be so much more right it's get i think out of that and realizing mm -hmm. you know i think that draws into self-esteem too is mm -hmm. you know realizing that you have the ability to reach your mm -hmm. potential you know, how do you, how do you help someone when they're, you know, when they, to get to that point where they, they really learn to, ex, you know, accept who they are, but yeah. they might have a false perception of who they are. Yeah. So how do you open your eyes to that person and let them see who they are, yeah. you know, and the real acceptance, who the person that you see, you know, because sometimes people are in that box and they can't see all the glorified things about them. Yeah. So how do you, how do you get them to really open their eyes and get out of that box for a minute and yeah. maybe see themselves as they're more than mm -hmm. what they really were? Sure. Well, the box, I mean, that goes with the, uh, you know, think out of the box, you know, as a mm -hmm. metaphor for like different ways of perceiving the world. Um, and um, there's a, one of my favorite ways of looking at or trying to find, trying to understand how we see the world is with different maps. Like we can't, yeah. We can't possibly take in all the information that's happening around us at all times. So we have to leave stuff out. You know, that's yes. that's a given, right? And so you can like 
there's people, I think it's plant blindness. Someone was writing about recently. Like some people just like, can't even think about all the plants around them. It's just plants. And then like, oh, look at this flower. Like, yeah, it's been there for two years. It's perennial, you know? <laughs> um, but so they have a world view. Like this is, the, you know, this is their 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 map. Um, but what I ask people to do is look in, most of us seem to have smartphones these days, go into your whatever map application you use and yeah. there's an option where you can look at the same where you are from a, a, a satellite view. Mm -hmm. um, there are bus stops. There's a public transit one. There's a traffic one. Um, but they're all looking at the same thing. Yeah. But they're completely different. Right. And so I'd run into people in, in relationships together that are operating at completely different maps. You're lying. You're lying. That's not even true. Well, because they're looking at different things. Yes. You know, they're they're in the same place and they're having different perceptions of the world. So this is kind of the first thing. You got to have the idea that there's different maps. And then, okay, so if we're already making meaning out of story, you know, out, out of our world, um, then it breaks you out of that there's more than, you know, that there's only one. You know, like some for some people's religious practice, there is one way there is mm -hmm. that is the way and anything that challenges it or questions it is wrong, if not apostate or dangerous. Right. So the idea that we can actually choose and make meaning is itself another paradigm. Right. You know, not everybody believes that it's possible to change that that perception. And so then you go another step. OK, I got a different map. It's possible to take information away. And then it's like, well, that means I can actually change the meaning of my life, the meaning of people making fun of me, the meaning right. of having these difficulties. And if I can change the meaning, what if I can make a different story out of it? You yeah. know, instead of the story is, I am such a failure, here I go failing again like I have failed a lot of times and I've learned a lot of things and I know how not to do it right you know, that's a better way that's I think a more effective way yes yeah you know and another way like if people have a lot of trouble with okay if I'm making up another story well, that means just means I'm lying to myself you know? right that just means I'm being delusional I don't want to be delusional that's that's right. crap so then I counter with it's like looking at the night sky. Okay, if you live in the city, you're not going to see much. <laughs> but if you go out in the country, there's more lights in the sky. Um, and if you're in the northern hemisphere, the same group of stars will be a little sauce water dipper. I wouldn't use this water dipper that I know of, but that's fine. Yeah. Water the dipper or a bear. And if you go back far enough, in times of Babylon, it was a wagon. Right. And apparently in, in Chinese tradition is a purple house. I still don't know exactly what that means, but there's a purple house. And so basically what that means is we're looking at the same data points. I even talked to a data scientist who loved this. because She's like, wait, yeah. I'm, I'm just looking at the data and the meaning is all me. I made it mm -hmm. up or someone else made it up and said, this is what it is. Right. Right. And instead of being handed, oh, this is what my life is. My parents said, I'm this. My parents said, I can't plan. My parents say, I will never be a dancer. My parents say, I can't sing. And going, maybe I can learn. Right. Maybe it's possible. Yes. That I can learn how to plan better. That I can right. learn how to be responsible and I haven't been responsible. You know, maybe I can um, quit smoking pot. Right. You know, my parents did handed it to me and they said this is what you're supposed to not literally my parents but i mean like <laughs> this is you know this is what i you know a child has been told this is the way the world is right you know, if they can go through these steps like there's different maps people have there's different meanings i can make there's different stories i can tell then they kind of get to oh i have a whole lot more influence over my own life yeah than i even know right Right. And I think that draws from positivity, yeah. self-esteem and being courageous yeah. and learning those qualities, like taking yeah. every yeah. negative thing that happens, 
pull something positive out of it. If we yeah. could pull something positive from mm -hmm. a negative event, mm -hmm. I think yeah. that just, you know, it kind of, we learn from it. It strengthens yeah. us. You know, everything yeah. that happens in our lives that's negative, we learn right. from it right. and it strengthens us because we overcome it. And sure. if you notice in, in life, no matter mm -hmm. what we go through, eventually mm -hmm. at the end, we always mm -hmm. pull through. Mm -hmm. It may be a long battle. It may be a short battle. It may be a hard battle, but mm -hmm. we always somehow get through it. Well, so that's, that's your story. Oh, I, I have lots of stories. <laughs> we'll be here for a couple hours. You really want to talk about sure. Now? <laughs> right. So, I mean, like, that's your story. That's how you make meaning of it. You know, I'm not right. sure that it's not everybody's story because others would, would, wouldn't be having this conversation. Right. Exactly. You know, so, your story, it has always worked out so far. Some people have terrible things happen to them and yeah. they don't know why it keeps happening. Right. You know, so I think it's important to me to balance this like to have critical thinking yeah. like okay that's not yeah. working that didn't work what can i learn from it but right. also not judgment judgment yes. doesn't help no it does not you know it critical thinking okay i have diabetes and i eat a gallon of ice cream every day you know you could be like oh this will all work out for the best uh maybe <laughs> <laughs> right or it could be critical thinking okay that is a lot of sugar that based on the data available is probably going to cause a problem right i'm not going to shift into self-judgment by saying like i'm a complete worthless human being look at me eat more ice cream right. um but rather okay this isn't probably going to work yeah i'm going to accept myself this is what got me here I'm not mm -hmm. dead yet. Right. And maybe I can create a meaning for myself where it's possible to change. You know, I can Excellent. change this habit. Yes. Yes. Without eviscerating myself because, you know, what have I done? I have diabetes now. I mean, right. Idiot. No, that, that, that's an excellent answer. It's like, you know, critical thinking can be very, very good because sometimes if we're too judgmental too quickly, right. you know, we're, we're going to give ourselves the mm -hmm. wrong answers, you yeah. know, or, mm -hmm. you know, a person that thinks they know us and, and mm -hmm. does the same method is going to give us the wrong answers. So yeah. it's really, really looking at it cr critically and then mm -hmm. re, you know, and, and resurfacing, you know, mm -hmm. a new way of dealing with the situation, coming to a, a positive, constructive yeah. solution. Yeah. you know and i also find you know when we go back to humor like 70 percent of stress causes illness so can can mm -hmm. you know can laughter really heal our wounds emotionally mm -hmm. and, and and physically Ooh. you know can yeah. you know can it really help us get through you know a lot of stuff and make us better physically mentally and you know or are we just fooling ourselves yeah or how powerful is humor it seems like it i mean i'm i'm because I'm a therapist uh, by by trade and profession, there's, you know, I have kind of put limits on claims that I can make. I don't have the data on this. I feel yeah, yeah. like it's true. I think it's true. I don't know, you know, and I'm just going to owe up to that. But I, yeah. but in terms of how I constructed this book, um, yes. Uh, in terms of like, does it help kids especially to laugh and create a better foundation for themselves, you know, for the rest of their lives? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote this book is to try to prevent hours of therapy for adults yeah. is to see if I can get kids at a certain age because around like eight to 12, there's a spot in there where comparison is happening, like comparing themselves to other, comparing their art, comparing their music to others has starts yeah. happening, but they don't really have critical thinking online yet. Right. Yeah. You know, so comparison seems to lead to either judgment or critical thinking. Yeah. You know, critical thinking is kind of neutral. Judgment is you're an idiot or you're worthless or, or I'm a fool. Yeah. But so in that age range, I wrote it to be well for me. I wrote it a lot of a lot of it was for my kids. They were like that age range group when I was first starting to work on it. Um, but it was specifically for the people that are starting to think in terms of, oh, I love they shouldn't to try to transition from like I make art, I love being making art. And somewhere in there they start to compare, oh, my art's not as good as 
Brian's or like Sharon's are funnier or like Luke's spaceships look more detailed. Right. I just, a lot of kids will just stop. Myself yeah. included. I stopped because I thought, well, I'm just not as good as that. Therefore, my life is over as an artist. I'll stop. Right. And what I'm trying to kind of poke a hole in is that erroneous belief system, you know, where you start to compare yourselves and, and get in a trap. Yeah. And I, I want to help people start to have critical thinking and compare, but have it be like, oh, then I will change. Right. I love drawing animals. So I will learn how to draw fur better. I will yeah. learn how to do curves better. I will mm -hmm. play with it. You know, I will have fun with it. And that will get me to the expertise I want. That's that's my dream with this book. Uh, do you, you know, we were talking about, it's kind of like a blend you mentioned earlier. It's mm -hmm. not just one way of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a blend of different exercises and different things. Can mm -hmm. you share with the audience like different different kinds of, exercises or tips that people can can do to yeah. actually get to that point sure well honestly a lot of books tend to go into like giving specific like do these things yeah for me i thought what was really important is for adults that are reading it for themselves to ask themselves a question and talk to their friends about it for yeah. parents to talk to their kids educators to talk to their kids about the story and yeah. ask questions. So like the last third of the book is um, is less, here's what you do, and more like, well, how is that working? Right. Like, what is something that feels dumb or stupid that might be cool if you gave it a chance? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a discussion, that's a, a discussion question that I think would be great um, in a classroom. You know, another podcaster I was uh, talked with uh, last month said this should be mandatory reading in schools. Like he really hopes it becomes like, you know, a a, a an influential thing um, because that, you know, because of the way it's done. Like I, I offer some anecdotes and your stuff for me, but I shift it to you. You know, yeah. like that's kind of the therapeutic role is, well, how can you, I can tell you stuff at the time, but how would you use this idea? Like, right. um, when is it the most unkind to make fun of people in social groups? Right. You know, and if kids are talking about this, they can kind of understand each other's perspective. Yeah. A little bit, or realize like that's a thing worth, worth chewing on. Um, growing up in a small town, you know, there's questions on that. Like if you grew up in a very, like this is restrictive, this is the way things are because the culture is small. How does right. that affect you? Does it mean right. you're better if you're a small town? Or does it mean if you're that you're better because you're from a big city and everyone else is an idiot? Right. If they're from a small town by definition. Mm -hmm. So the main tip would be um, you know, sure, mindfulness and, and some self-acceptance, but also asking. Yeah. Asking other people, what's it like to be you? Right. I mean, uh, my understanding is a lot of people that are in that are having trouble um with the places they're in is you know if they they are in a very liberal city and they have relatives that are say from a little further out and they're conservative or otherwise it's hard to ask the questions and if you don't have the exposure to someone uh that is jewish jewish will be something other and exotic if you yes. don't ask you mm -hmm. know if you don't know someone who's from Ethiopia um, and, you know, you will probably simplify, you know, oh, they're like this, all of them right. are like that. And it's really hard if you don't have the exposure to other ways of being. Yeah. Yes. You know, everyone like me is the way things are. And yeah. That's what he grew up with, you know, like he's, he's a crab, but he didn't even know it because there's no crabs around. Yes. All there are fish. So he's like, well, I'm just really bad at this. And so like, it's the making contact, the yeah. asking questions, getting a little out of your comfort zone. Right. And I think that's so important because I think, you know, I find that many people when they're, they, they live in a certain environment for so long, 
it becomes a part of them and they don't, you know, they, they just create their own judgments and the way things are supposed to be. And they don't realize that everybody's different and everybody has different needs, different thoughts, different feelings, has lived different lives. And they just look at things from their own set of eyes and their own perspective. And they don't realize that mm-hmm. everybody is different. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, I think that's very good that you teach yeah. people. And because I think it, mm-hmm. it, we learned it at an early age. I think a lot of us would have been better off when we grow up because it's hard to change as we grow. But if we can nip it in the bud and learn how to understand people better, mm-hmm. it, you know, easily communicate better with others mm-hmm. and, you know, really learn to, you know, accept others and especially mm-hmm. accept ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it, life can be fun and, and, you know, it's great to find the fun, you know, if you like, um, Mary Poppins, you know, that's a great thing about find the fun and the jobs have done. Yeah. I teach that to my kids. But it is also hard sometimes. You know, it can yeah. be really, really hard. And sometimes for, in some situations, it is really, really, really hard. How can you find the fun when you're surviving a natural disaster or exactly. some kind of attack? Exactly. How can you cope with that? Oh, I've seen a lot of people in a lot of different situations um, learn to find a way to laugh i mean that yeah. was my conversation with john cleese he was so moved i forget where he was but he was doing some kind of comedy show um or something with, that was comedy related and it was in an area that was relatively war-torn recently and he was just so moved that people living in such a difficult situation could laugh yeah you know and, and can find it extremely moving and i'm totally with that because um it can be healing there's some finesse to get it to be healing oh i think yeah. it does yeah, yeah. I, I i think humor is, is very he- healing you know i think if we could just step out of uh you know our seriousness zone and i think that's what our society is kind of pulling back on i feel like people have become so serious every little thing someone says they take the they take it to context and they, they just you know and they mm-hmm. take it so seriously or they overanalyze a statement, you know, and it becomes more of a of an issue that doesn't even have to be an issue. You know, I think when we were growing up, we, you know, lots of things were said in the media, in front of people, and people didn't take it so seriously. It was just a joke, you know, and people knew how to joke and people laughed mm-hmm. it off, or they would come back with a sarcastic response in a jokingly way. Mm-hmm. And both people laughed and the stress was sure. relieved. You know? sure. And it actually, you know, mm-hmm. there was no, there was no anger. It mm-hmm. actually made people on yeah. both sides, maybe even, you yeah. know, like yeah. each other more. And sure. you know, I think this is something that your book is something very important that we need because mm-hmm. I think we're lacking it in this generation. And mm-hmm. I think we really need to, you know, learn how to mm-hmm. use and to, and to take, you yeah. know, look at, in a more, you know, critical and non-judgmental sense, you know. Sure. And uh, is there any other tips that you'd like to offer the, the listeners? You know, we've sure. gone over a lot of important stuff. Humor yeah. is a big factor of healing, you know, that we've, yeah. we've come across and we've mm-hmm. ta- come across not being so judgmental and maybe lo- looking at things critically because mm-hmm. everybody has a different life yeah. and everybody looks at things differently. Mm-hmm. But what are some important factors for mm-hmm. people to learn about acceptance, acceptance of themselves and accepting others for who they are sure. and growing and not being so judgmental sure. and being able to excel yeah. and be yeah. happier. Well, I think it can really go down to one particular phrase, uh, mammal maintenance. Mm-hmm. And so what that means, what mammal maintenance means is recognizing that the homo sapiens that we think we are is often not exactly running the show. Right. When someone else gets stressed or feels unsafe, let alone when we get stressed or feel unsafe, we're not always at our best. No. You know, we can say things we regret. Other people can be really agitated and irritated about things. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, I am find it really useful, especially with couples, to help each help them visualize that there's their partner sitting there 
And there's also some kind of variably trained wild dog or horse or something that occasionally comes out. Right. And what I mean for that is if we are, if we use humor without care, mm -hmm. it can be a really unsafe work environment. Yeah. You know, take a joke that was extremely sexist and I feel unsafe. Yeah. Oh, that was just funny. Why are you being so sensitive? Well, because you insulted like my entire race. Right. Like you just minimized me to like a stereotype. Yes, it was funny and 80% of the people laughed and thought it was great and thought I should just chill, but that yeah. stings. Yeah. And so I think that's what all this, the, the, the taking things seriously is supposed to be is because we kind of took like, let's keep things safe for people, but we took a little too far. Yeah. You know, power is important. Being kind is important, but mm -hmm. whew, yeah. we've got to find a way through. Yeah. You know, and if we're conscious about power, we're conscious about how we impact people. We don't have to take, have all the rules in quite the same way. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not alone in this. I listened to some comedy from Dave Chappelle recently, who was super in trouble with a lot of people. Yeah. You know, especially in the trans community. Mm -hmm. But what I found out that really rattled me is that he had actually been a, a transgender ally in a very meaningful way to another comic for a while you know, had a conversation, got to know them, asked questions yeah. and had been supporting their work for some time. But as soon as he said something that people thought, honestly, I don't remember what it was, that people yeah. thought, oh, this is a transphobe. It was like, okay, maybe he's making a joke and there are people that are very sensitive and will have be negatively impacted. Yeah. But he's also trying to move the, the culture towards right. let's joke about stuff, you know? You're right. Yeah. Like he's, he's the sort of person that m found it okay to make fun of a mixed gender marriage right. and someone got really offended and he's like, exactly. Cause I'm in a mixed culture marriage. I'm in a mixed race marriage and I'm a yeah. product of a mixed race marriage. That's right. why I'm making this joke because yes. he's laughing at himself. Right. Right. And that's so challenging right now. You yeah. Know? Like it is a very difficult topic um, everywhere. And the sensitivity yeah. is important. You know, the, the the seriousness is important. I just don't think that's all there is. Right. I, th I, I you know, how do we get to that point where people don't take things so seriously, where mm -hmm. people are able to want, joke about things like we mm -hmm. once were, you know, yeah. in the 80s and 90s, you know, mm -hmm. you, you see a lot of the sitcoms, we would mm -hmm. never be them back on tv again you know right um it would yeah. be it, you know it would be chaos if we yeah. you know when we had you know we had a lot of funny sitcoms and you know mm -hmm. and they would make jokes they would make jokes about race they would make jokes about this and that but they went right. you know one would make joke you know say something about the other race and the other race would say something to them and right. and people laughed it was like right. you know it wasn't two, you know two against one or you know you know two, you know mm -hmm. Right. one person would say something yeah. and the other person of the other mm -hmm. race would say something yeah. mm -hmm. and it was funny and people mm -hmm. laughed and no one yeah. took it more than what it was they yeah. didn't they didn't analyze it they didn't make it bigger than what it was mm -hmm. you know they both said something and it was truthful and and but and and they yeah. just laughed and, yeah you know, i don't well, see no, us I, I think it would be great because I, I, I think the the missing part of that honestly is like there were we didn't hear the voices of the people that were hurt they yeah. were marginalized because there was no room for them. Right, right, you right. Know? So, I mean, like, I think going back to the way things were, get tougher, everybody should take a joke. I think there's some wisdom to it. Mm -hmm. I just think it, the a, 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 a cooler way through is responsible comedy. You know, if you yeah. make the joke, you know, going back to the strong back soft front, if you make the joke, go with it, commit to the joke and then check, dude, did I cross the line? right was that okay yeah. mm -hmm. seriously oh okay that was oh yeah okay i won't tell that again i'll take that you know i'm listening 
You know, right. if it's a dialogue, if you're responsible, if you're accountable for the impact that you have, I think we can loosen up a little bit. Right. I, I think forgiveness has to come in too. So when people yeah. do make mistakes, don't crucify them. Yeah. You know, you know, mm-hmm. they realize they made a mistake. They realize they might have crossed the line. Let's yeah. forgive them and mm-hmm. they learn, you sure. know, and we don't we don't hold it against them because I feel yeah. like a lot of people hold grudges and mm-hmm. you know it's for a lot of people it's hard for people to let go mm-hmm. of those sure. grudges. But sure. that's a way of healing, I think, and yeah. even accept, building yeah. your acceptance to yeah. also. Well, there's a lot of people that feel unsafe. You know, I think that's where it comes from. You know, we yeah. can tell ourselves a story we're unsafe at all times, or we can realize that if we've experienced a lot of trauma, we are tuned to look for danger. Yeah. Like our nervous system actually physically changes temporarily to prioritize speed of response. Yeah. And make sure the right people are punished or or canceled. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're ready to act. You know, yeah. but that's a little more mammal. That's a little more like triggered, you know, yeah. like barking dog, right. like, you know, enraged elephant kind right. of mammal. Yeah. Um, it's if we can help people shift their nervous system from that mm-hmm. ready for speed, then the other thing happens. You can shift the nervous system towards connection. Right. And that blew my mind mm-hmm. that we can actually have our, our our nervous system stuck in one gear, which is danger mode or connection mode, mm-hmm. right? And that's why that mammal maintenance is important because if you can get someone see like, oh, you're in stress, mm-hmm. that joke impacted you. I want right. to hear all about it. You know, how did I hurt you? Right. Is there more? How did that impact you? I want yeah. to hear it. I'm not going to go into shame. I can, I can take it. I can right. hear how I impacted you. Right. You know, and that mammal kind of mammal maintenance helps people go into safety. Mm-hmm. And then the connection is possible. Right. So like the, the a great way is to like, I want people to feel safe so they can be strong. And then we can get along. Like right. in those three steps. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes very much so. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I like that. I I think this is great. I think what you're doing is great. And I think it's great that you have this book out because it's, it's geared towards both adults and children Mm -hmm. and communication is key, you know, and that's how we learn. And that's what you're, you're, you're provoking communication, you know, and, and it's, and it's, you know, instigating growth, you know, mentally, you know, and I think it's excellent. Now, where can people find your book? Where can people go to get your book? Sure. Well, it's uh, it's on Amazon and um, lots of other booksellers. So um, Finney Books in Seattle was the first place to start carrying the book. Uh, so I'm really happy to support them. But not fishyenough.com will lend you will get you right to where can I find it? You know, a local bookstore near me, Barnes and Noble, uh, wherever whatever country you're in. There's you know this global distribution. Now, do you have your own website with I your? Do about can you tell us what your website is so people sure. can also sure it's brittoncolber.com so i've got to spell it because it's a challenging name so b-r-i-t-o-n and like november uh k-o-l-b-e-r brittoncolber.com that's where you'll find my stuff and also links to the book and if people want to um maybe acquire your services do you have online services where they could do therapy maybe mm-hmm. through or something like that right um, so it's, uh, currently in Washington state and working on the state of Illinois. Um, but so if you're in those States, then we can, then we can talk. Otherwise I can give you, you know, advice or like where to go next or how to refine therapy in your area. But, um, as of now it's, uh, there's licenses, uh, it's just for Washington and Illinois is the way it works. Okay. And do you have any type of blog or any information that would be useful for people on your website or? Uh, I don't really have a blog. Um, I do occasionally post stuff on Instagram. That's uh, psychology metaphors is where I'm mm-hmm. at on Instagram. Okay. Um, so those are, those are the best places to find me. 
Oh, great. This has been wonderful. You know, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been really useful because I think people really, this is something that is really needed in our society. You know, acceptance of, of who we are and acceptance of others is, is something that people really need to, you know, it, it really either enhance in their lives. There's always room to get better or they need to really work on it and maybe they're not there yet. But, you know, I think through, you know, everything that we've discussed, all the information you provided, I think is very beneficial and it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this. And I can't wait to get your book because I want to read it myself. I'm very excited. <laughs> Good pleasure. Thanks a lot. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. Yeah.